Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and once again I am joined by none other than... Drakinifel. <laughs> and this week this is our third part, and we're going to be taking a look at the largest ships of Star Trek, so this will be quite an interesting one. Indeed. Yes, the, um, the, the big capital ships, the battleships, the battle cruisers, and anything that gets even bigger than that. Yes, yes. We'll see how far down that rabbit hole we want to go. Um, but I think before we... I, th I think we said l at the end of the last video, um, we'd before we got into that, we'd jump into the can of worms that is the Prometheus. Yes. Yes. Because <laughs> we've had interesting conversations about that ship. And yeah. Mixed feelings. Yeah, the... The Prometheus is a bit of a weird one. Um, obviously, in real life, there weren't any ships that detached into three to to go and uh, attack the enemy, or or mm -hmm. detached into anything. Um, there there are a couple of technically kind of examples. One of which we mentioned in a previous one, we were talking about the attack craft, which was the ships like the Heckler and the Vulcan, which were motherships to torpedo boats. Mm. So, yeah. in a way, it's kind of similar in that it's sort of one ship that would attach multiple smaller ships to attack, but they're, you know, all, th all parts of the Prometheus are supposed to be offensive as opposed yes. to, you know, an unarmed mothership. The other, th other one which is quite hilarious, is the Matsushima-class cruisers of Japan, which again fall into our 1890 period, which, um, for those of you who are listening at home, hopefully a picture will be appearing on screen at this point, um, but they are catastrophically bad ships in that the Japanese in the 1890s were still very much of the uh, what was called the Je ne Cole concept, which thought that big battleship navies could be overcome with smaller, cheaper navies that were made up of torpedo boats and cruisers. And then someone pointed out, well, yeah, but if the enemy shows up off of your coastline in bad weather or with an escort and all you have are torpedo boats, then it's just going to bully its way through them. So this was kind of an idea that was part of the Je ne Cole, which is basically a near enough unprotected cruiser with a single battleship cannon stuck on it. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets even better because they originally planned to build four of them. And the idea was for the four ships to conga line um, <laughs> with two ships armed with a battleship gun forward, two ships armed with a battleship gun aft. And they'd kind of therefore form this four part pseudo battleship. So it was, it was it was basically a, the naval equivalent of the Megazord. Yes, yeah, basically. Um, <laughs> except that each part was very squishy, <laughs> and yeah. as it turned out, sticking a battleship-grade gun on a relatively small cruiser meant that your rate of fire went through the floor. So they had a hilariously poor rate of fire. They were hilariously vulnerable. The gun uh, and the gun with a single shot. Um, using visual aiming only, <laughs> the chances of actually hitting anything were relatively slim, and they also only end up building three. So you, had one of the uh, tail end gun ships, wasn't able to uh, join them. And to be fair, it was a good chance of. It was a good reason why the Japanese abandoned the Jinnacol shortly thereafter and went went for more conventional battleship fleets amongst other reasons so that that's probably the closest you get to the prometheus in real life except in that case it's four separate ships designed to fight as one rather than yes. one ship designed to fight as three <laughs> but yeah um as we've talked about offline previously the prometheus doesn't make a lot of sense from an attack ship perspective I mean, it's small. It's compact. Yeah, it, it's mean, a sovereign. It's a sovereign. It's clearly a sovereign era vessel. So, yes. I mean, aesthetically, I really like the yes. Prometheus, and I like that it's a quarter cell ship because actually, we don't have many of them in canon, and the other two are basically kit bashes. So this is the only kind of original, uh, purpose built quad cell ship. Um, so I think it looks great. I mean, one of the things you can probably see on what i've sent you there is mm. it's quite it's surprisingly small yes 
something that's about 415 meters long and you think fits into the larger side of cruiser probably at the top end of light cruiser it's still very small yeah it's i mean it in in a way it kind of if it was if you're considering it as a single ship it it makes sense in an era of the defiant the sovereign and all those other ships in that it, they've probably compacted down the ship to be a pure war vessel so all the extraneous mm -hmm. stuff that makes up federation exploration dash science vessels that have an the occasional ability to fight you know all of that's gone and you're left with this core thing which in a way does emphasize how far ahead the federation is technologically compared to some uh other yes. powers um but also in 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 some ways it's it's almost following a more Klingon mentality because in the cruiser section we discussed how the Vorcha is is still a kind of a, a kind of heavy cruiser, even though it's yeah. by mass it's actually considerably smaller than some of the approximate equivalents. And this is kind of, if you like, almost a Federation Vorcha. It's a it's a it's a ship that is pure firepower. Yes, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, unlike the Vorcha the whole thing of splitting off into pieces because yes. ultimately when you split it down into those um three pieces you're looking at three destroyer sized craft yes and and then i must admit when i saw the zine the first time apart from the oh cool thing um i was sort of going well hang on a minute you know by tng ds9 ships are taking most of the power for their weapons from their warp core yes this thing at best each of these ships has one third of a warp core. <laughs> yes. Which, and given that some of the beta cannon attributes, sort of the longer warp cores have more power because they can accelerate matter and antimatter to greater speeds or something yeah, uh, yeah. like that. Um, having, at least by beta cannon, having a shorter warp core actually would mean an exponential decrease in power. So that doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense either. Yeah. I mean, you have like the Defiant Warp Core, which mm. they specifically say is um, very powerful for its size. Like it's so powerful, the ship can barely handle it initially. Yes. Um, and then like in in like later ships like the Sabre, this is kind of veering again, veering mm. into beta cannon. And it's debated heavily with the Sabre, whether they put the core in vertical or if they put it in horizontally. And that like helps it contain mm. the core better as opposed to the Defiant, which is just ready to kind of rip itself apart. But I wonder, like, as opposed to the Defiant, which is just ready to kind of rip itself apart. But I wonder, like, okay, so you take these three Defiant warp cores and you put them, Defiant slash Sabre warp cores, and you put them into one... Why don't why don't you just build three Sabres? Yes. Yeah, I mean, as 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 an attack ship, as a single vessel, the Prometheus does make a lot of sense in context of the Defiant and the Sovereign, as this sort of triple mode assault. In in a mainline battle, it really makes very little sense. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I could see it potentially having some use in the kind of long term knockdown drag out fights that you see in the Dominion War. But not so much in a, oh, we'll split the vessel up in order to attack the enemy, but more of a, we go in as one ship, and, you know, if, like, in half an hour in, somebody just completely plasters the upper saucer section with Polaron beams, and it's effectively dead weight mm -hmm. at that point, you could jettison the upper section, and then the lower two sections could keep on fighting relatively unimpeded. Um, and obviously yeah. you can maybe evacuate the crew down into the other two sections, maybe considering it's got at least one third of a warp core and it even use the effectively shot to pieces section as a kamikaze missile, which will probably uh, do a, something. Yes. Well, funnily enough, I don't think it's a detail we mentioned, but mm. I presume you've heard of how the deflector dish on the Defiant yeah. is literally meant to just be, or can be just jettisoned and smash into whatever you feel like yes which which is a, actually a bit of a, a bugbear of mine because on a, a number of the defiant models i have it's it seems like the model makers actually they knew about that and rigged it for that so the nose section oh, always no. goes loose and rattly all the time oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but never mind I mean, yeah i mean one of the problems i was thinking about this with the prometheus is that this is you know you can eject pieces but um, you need 
you need the beta piece for it to yes. function as a, as a as a joint ship. The the alpha and and gamma section, so the saucer and mm -hmm. the bottom section, can't fit together without that piece. No. So surely, you know, yes, it might involve limiting your fire because actually, just thinking about it from like the front, you probably wouldn't even be able to hit the uh, the beta section. Mm have to hit the top or bottom the yeah. saucer or the bottom piece uh, but maybe you just wait and you save your shots for when it's you know pass when it's passing by yeah then you just wail on middle section and then the, then it's sort of um yeah, and a spot of bother then yeah i mean i i mean we, we are kind of reaching a little bit to try and justify it, the thing in the way that it's supposed to be used in a frontline com combat role um but to a, to a certain degree, I can see it as kind of maybe a slightly more recyclable, um, what would the best term be? Basically, a ship that would be more suited for prolonged conflict because you could have a you could have a stock of spare hull sections, perhaps yeah. back behind the lines, um, in case, as you say, in case the beta section takes a hammering, but. You know, if you if you think about it in terms of maybe an Excelsior or something like that, if an Excelsior gets badly torn up, it needs to go back into a shipyard, and that's it. That yeah. ship is out of the fight. Whereas, if say you have half a dozen Prometheus and half a dozen Excelsior, three of the Excelsiors get torn up, you're now down to three ships. If you have six Prometheus and three of them get torn up then in theory you might be able to cobble together one maybe two fully functioning prometheus from the relatively undamaged sections of the ones that have been badly battered which would then mean that your force is now you know it's still four or five ships despite having yeah. the originally taken similar damage so it gives you gives you a little bit more endurance on the front lines yeah, it's so it's yeah it's built for a sustained conflict. I yes. I, I think that that works that does work yeah. um, better. I think I think the whole idea of multi vector assault mode because they talk a lot about automation. I mean, I'm mm. just thinking the other the other thing, and I'll touch on this again when we uh, maybe talk, touch on one of the other ships pictured there. Mm -hmm. um, but the use of uh, decoys. I'm just yes. thinking. So if you you're in real trouble. It's gone really badly, mm -hmm. and you want to get out of dodge very quickly. But there are a lot of enemy ships chasing you. Mm. Um, maybe you actually send, say, the saucer section or whichever section. Mm. But everyone gets on that, and then because of like the notional remote control capabilities yes. of the Prometheus, you then maybe have just one or two people go off on the other two sections, and they go and and fend off the enemy. That's a that's yeah. a possibility. Considering, I mean, that that is an interest. The automation of the Prometheus is interesting mm -hmm. because they specifically say in Deep Space Nine that Starfleet is having a personnel crisis. Yes, because a lot of them are getting blown up because they're being sent out of Miranda's yes. <laughs> against the Dominion. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, it, yeah, that that's an, that is another valid possibility. Um, the other thing that it that struck me with the Prometheus is that it actually outside of the context of the dominion war and just in the general context especially of what we see in the star trek series themselves it could also make a certain degree of sense as a patrol vessel especially for somewhat more contested areas mm. because if you think about it you know what do we see a lot of the time with especially tng um you know it's the only ship in the area you know, it has a mission, but something shiny has distracted it. You know, odd sensor reading in a system three <laughs> three over. And then so you've got this entire galaxy class ship either not being able to fulfill its original mission or going off its original patrol route. And now they're they're messing around with something that could very well, especially if you're talking about a sort of a contested or hot area like the Romulan demilitarized zone prior to the Dominion War or Dominion lines in the quieter periods, you know. It could be a decoy, it could be a trap, it could yes. be a way of distracting or opening a hole in the in the patrol uh, cordon to get sneak something through. Yeah, well, that's specifically they do the Romulans do that in unification. Mm -hmm. 
exactly they could yeah. be enterprises like getting a saying hang on something's a little bit fishy with these with these vulcan ships that have just come out of romulan space mm. Maybe we should have a look oh wait there's a there's a disaster on whatever planet it was yeah and we're the only ship we better yeah yeah and so in in that sense the prometheus might make a very good patrol ship because as a whole starship as you mentioned it's four nacelle so it's fast and got long endurance and it's quite powerful and then if um, you know, there's an odd sensor reading in some weird system somewhere far over. They can just turn around and say, OK, right, well, we're going to detach the alpha hull or the gamma hull. And we're going to send that to go investigate that. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if the things get really hot, the, the other two, the other two bits can go in and, and investigate and, and join up. But it doesn't detract from the ship's ability to continue its patrol route. And in theory, yep. if it does all three, if it does a, a three-way split, it can in be investigating two separate contacts while still maintaining its original That's patrol cool. route, which Patrolling. makes it, yeah. And then once the once whatever it is is over, they can then turn around, reintegrate, and you're back to having a, quite a powerful single patrol ship, <laughs> which would significantly increase Starfleet's um, capabilities when it comes to border patrol. I mean, I I would throw just because I can't resist. I would throw mm -hmm. a small spanner in in the works of that and say, mm -hmm. well, why don't you just carry more runabouts on your ships? True. Um, my my main response to that would be that if if it is something worth investigating, there's a relatively high chance that if you send a runabout, it may wear it very well just be blown apart. Whereas, as you said, with the Prometheus hulls they kind of destroy a size so if we take it as red that they've got kind of a destroyer capability approximately mm. then it's unless it's something like a full-on enemy battleship it's very unlikely that your 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 detached hull section is going to die or if it is it's if it's ambushed by like a squadron or something even if that does happen it's going to take a while which means you're going to get warning out as opposed to yes. oh look the runabout vanished i wonder what that what, why that was yeah. <laughs> yes and then have to go and investigate that and yeah yeah i mean the uh, the other thing um i and i think again we talked about this previously the idea that actually one of the problems the federation has with its border security is the fact that it's surrounded by a lot of um more primitive powers that mm. but that have a real axe to grind so be that like um the Telerians, who are pathetic they're absolutely pathetic i mean they're so yeah. weak that in beta cannon the cardassians beat them in a war <laughs> um you know so they're pretty weak and yet they still you know take little pot shots at the federation um and so again rather than having to devote a whole squadron of starships to patrolling border with what is really quite a minor power who's just really annoying mm. could just send a prometheus yes yeah and um yeah and i th that that makes a lot of sense and i think the i suppose the, the other thing when it comes to the prometheus specifically and as you mentioned the fact that you've got all these smaller slightly less technically advanced powers is that the they those powers tend to go one of two ways they tend to either go with lots and lots and lots and lots of smaller ships aka the klingons with their swarms and swarms of birds mm. of prey um or they or the breen as well um or they tend to go for just absolutely massive ships like the romulans with the dideradex yeah. At which point, you know, if you if you have a border patrol that's made up of sabers, for example, they can probably deal with you know incursions of birds of prey or breen frigates perfectly fine. But if a Dideradex shows up and the only thing on in the sector is a saber, well, <laughs> you're, you're a, yeah. a, bit, a bit up the creek without a paddle at that point. Whereas yeah. with a Prometheus, you've kind of got, in theory, the firepower to give a warbird pause but also the ability to just go off and deal with the odd incursion, small incursion without, as I said, pulling up, pulling something massive off the line. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say give give a Dideridex pause. I know that in in the episode, destroy a Dideridex, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm like, hmm. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. 
Yeah, it's, it's it's such a the Derelict is such a massive ship, and you kind of look at it going, um, what have the Romulan sensors not advanced to the point that they can't track more than one contact at a time? And yeah. at, at that point, to be honest, there's already an Akira and a couple of Defiance there, so there's already technically four ships. So adding another two, you know, isn't going to change all that much in terms of yes. sensors being overwhelmed or, or or the mob attack. And as we know, Star Trek shields, yes, you can redirect power from certain sectors to other sectors, but they are 360 degree shields. It's not like the shields only work in one direction. One direction. So you yeah. can't sneak around from behind. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a funny scene. But like I say, yeah, I, th I think that's I think that's an interesting assessment. I think yeah, perhaps there is some uses for the Prometheus, but certainly it's not probably not the juggernaut that I think a lot of people probably build build up from just watching the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, especially when you consider that, um, you know, as we said, it, it, it's it's of the sovereign era. And the sovereign exists. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't put a sovereign above the Dudirodex. The main thing the sovereign can do is is run away and uh, keep the Dudirodex at range. That's mm. probably all the main thing it can do. But I think we're getting we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So yeah. I think should we talk now about the other ships that I've there on that picture? Yes. The sort of other. Little cruisers, um, so or I, you know, I'm, I'm in half my because they're all very different. So we've mm. got the Nebula, which is squash down galaxy. It literally is just a squash down galaxy. Yeah. We've got the Dominion battle cruiser, which is pretty big. It's 650 meters, so it's a it's about the same size as a galaxy. Mm -hmm. They call it a battle cruiser. And then we've got here. This is uh, I don't know if you've seen lower decks the parliament class yes i mean i'm into and i'm kind of i like it and I, I like the aesthetic a lot of people seem to think that it's a post dominion war kind of ship looking at it with those kind of engines which are not quite sovereign engines mm. they're more into like voyager or even prometheus engines and then you look at the deflector dish mm -hmm. which is very tng like for me it's it's kind of like an trepid era ship yeah it's kind of like it's the halfway house it's a it's a post tng but it's not it's not a, a sovereign an enterprise e sovereign era ship yeah um which is a bit odd considering that technically speaking the enterprise e predates the dominion war as well so it's definitely not post dominion war design even if the potentially the production may not have gotten they may not have gotten a significant production run going before the dominion war but yeah, it definitely doesn't strike me as a a post Dominion War design. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's not. It doesn't look outrageously um, advanced. And I th and I think when you consider for me when it was like looking at Starfleet, if the only other kind of if we're calling battle cruiser Starfleet has is a Nebula, um, it's it's sort of lacking in that kind of faster end because Nebula is not fast. No. Nebula has one less engine than a impulse engine than a galaxy class. It only has the saucer impulse units. It doesn't have the one on the neck because it doesn't have a neck. Uh, and it is just as heavy, if not heavier, than a galaxy class. Yeah. Um, I mean, th this comes around to a whole argument about what is a battle cruiser, which is. Mm -hmm. It is always a fun one. The <laughs> uh, I mean, battle cruisers in our target period are sort of eighteen nineties, nineteen hundreds are just about coming in at the end of it. Although there are, you can argue there are some predecessors to them in role, if not necessarily, um, in terms of all of the features that we associate with a battle cruiser. But one of the things that's always always associated with battle cruisers, no matter what era, no matter what time or design is that they have speed and mm. that that does make things a little bit difficult to yeah if if the nebula is not as fast as a galaxy it makes yeah. it makes it difficult to classify the nebula as a battle cruiser so much yeah. 
it's um because yes the uh, gen the the rule of thumb for a battle cruiser although obviously it's not in, in necessarily entirely 100 percent accurate all the time is that they generally have slightly less firepower than a battleship but of the same kind of caliber so you know type x phasers in yeah. this case but they're faster and somewhat less well protected and the nebula has the firepower bit box ticked it has the probably because of it probably has the uh, protection section being slightly less well protected than a galaxy probably also ticked but doesn't necessarily have the speed unless yeah. there's a unless there's one of the little um uh pylon modules that you can attach yes. to it that gives gives it yeah, a bit that, of a boost <laughs> yeah i was going to say yeah you do have the wolf 359 mm. uh, nebulas which had the additional little uh, warp engines i think they were basically it'd be new orleans type engines yeah. in terms of size um yes if that whether that's really representative for the entire class n not sure i mean no, again I mean, we see that we see the um sort of swept back pod um style a lot more often than any other yes i mean i was specifically with that uh pod I think it's meant to be, or it, it's shown to be, a torpedo launcher. Yeah. And if you look at some of the 3D models, it's got a lot of torpedo launchers. It's not just one, it's like several. Uh, so in some ways, it might actually outgun a Galaxy class, which only has the mm. four and aft launcher and then yeah. maybe a dorsal launcher. Although I suppose, given that the Galaxy has that theoretical 10 torpedo spread per launcher which we only rarely ever see it use um and that's in the neck which the nebula doesn't have so i guess it, i guess it's kind of well someone needs to write an alpha or beta cannon expanded encyclopedia or like a jane's fighting ships of the 24th century to tell us mm. <laughs> whether the you know multi are, are these multiple single torpedo launcher tubes on the nebula or are they as nasty as the the ten the ten torpedo launcher of the galaxy yeah yeah well because it does also come in with the we skipped over it mm -hmm. in in cruisers but the akira mm. um because again that has a lot of torpedo launchers on the model and one of the questions is well why do you need so many when you have these multiple launch uh launchers and the explanation i've kind of come up with is that you can have your 10 shot launcher mm -hmm. but you have to load up 10 shots and the loader only goes so fast so if you want to save up for a big burst sure if you want to put out a consistent um rate of fire of torpedoes or you want to um and you want to have more torpedoes going out than just one and and that's when you start needing to look at having more launchers yeah and and i mean also you could there, there's also a you could take an inspiration from torpedo launchers again in real life. So when you look at destroyers and cruisers of the period that we've been talking about, say for the mm. viewers, the 1890s to 1900s, you have the more traditional torpedo launchers that everybody's used to, the above deck torpedo launchers. And at this period, they come in single, single and twin varieties. The triples aren't until kind of mid world war two and beyond. They're relatively quick to train, relatively quick to fire but then obviously you have to reload them if you happen to carry reloads. In real life, a lot of ships didn't. Obviously, in Star Trek, you have magazines. Uh, they're proportionally smaller weapons. Yes. But um, if you have a battery, like, say, on a large destroyer or a cruiser of a couple of twin torpedo tubes above water, you can let, let off, you know, a salvo of anything from one to four torpedoes from your separate tubes, and then you have to reload them all. But then on battleships, a lot of battleships at the time will have underwater torpedo tubes, and they're only single tube launchers. So you, could, you and often they only have one tube per axis, so four forward, aft, port, and starboard. So you can only fire a single torpedo at a time from that launcher, as opposed to multiple torpedoes from uh, the surface launchers. But you have a much more extensive magazine behind that. Um, so you could have a uh, you know, a magazine of maybe have a up to a dozen torpedoes 
which you can then with a the crew down there in the in the torpedo loading room can they can load another one and fire it load another one and fire it etc uh, which is a yeah. bit more of the model of how star trek t- treats its torpedo launchers for the most part yes. unless you're a wolf 359 kit mash um yes but where, yeah. where i'm kind of going with that is it's in some ways you could almost treat it as a you know it's not a direct correlation but you can get the idea of you could have a single launcher um but you know it it fires a a torpedo there's not a lot behind it you load another torpedo it fires another torpedo it's a relatively low impact in terms of the ship's hull uh installation whereas Mm -hmm. the 10 torpedo launcher you've got this well you've got a cluster launcher so presumably your tube is a little bit bigger but also as you said you've got the loading mechanisms to load 10 torpedoes um you've got the magazine that means that you're not going to drain the magazine in three salvos so yes. you, you it might be just a fractionally larger launcher from an exterior perspective but actually if you look at cross section interior wise that launcher might be an absolutely massive installation that can't really fit on most smaller starships oh, yes and i think that that makes a lot of sense when you look at the movie era enterprise you know from mm. um the 23rd century and they specifically have two torpedo launchers in the neck with like two separate loading tracks so that they can actually achieve a consistent rate of fire because we see the the loading procedure for those torpedoes is slow mm. so yeah I, I think that's yeah i think that's a good good explanation um and then that yeah might make sense as to um yeah, why you see multiple launchers in in a world where you also have multiple launch launchers. Yes, it's kind of an alpha strike versus can sustained fire, which makes sense yes. for the smaller ships. You know, Nakira, it's going to be flitting around and buzzing around and probably just wants to be popping torpedoes all the time. Something like a Galaxy, realistically, you probably want to swoop in on a really big, nasty target maybe batter its shields down with your phasers and then just when the shields start to fluctuate you just dump 10 torpedoes into the yes. face of the enemy but then you've yes. got to sweep past come around and by the time you've come around for another pass you've probably got enough time to reload your your big torpedo launcher yes yeah um but yeah i would say so i mean going back to the mm. nebula so i mean it's got all that that kind of potential firepower of the galaxy potentially more sustained firepower as well with the, with the multiple launchers um so it maybe does sit better just as as a lower rating battleship i'm not sure yeah which actually Is makes the... i was gonna say that actually makes sense in the time period again because in the time period that we're looking at in real life there are such things as second class battleships um, yeah, they're not the all singing, all dancing front line ships that are supposed to slug it out with other front line ships. They're mostly designed to be foreign station flagships, or they're old. If they're downrated, they're older ships that have been you know, relegated to that role. But there are purpose designed second class ships, and as I say they're designed to be foreign station flagships where they're big enough and mean enough to destroy anything that that come that they're likely to come across so enemy cruisers of any description on down because they're operating in areas where it's unlikely that the few key major powers are going to deploy an actual full-on battleship but they also have a secondary role of you know if push comes to shove and it's a major throwdown they've still got the firepower to sidle up into the battle line and help out even if and they've got the speed even if they haven't necessarily got maybe the same endurance or the same total number of guns and torpedoes and so forth and the nebula might especially with this kind of interchangeable pod i feel it almost does feel fill that kind of niche it's uh you know if starfleet want something big heavy and nasty in the general vicinity but the reason that they're deploying it there isn't quite serious enough to merit them deploying a galaxy but one of their few galaxies then a a sort Mm. of a smaller slightly faster to manufacture nebula which can then be pre-spec'd to the role it's going to be doing by swapping in a pod begins to make a lot of sense and then 
in once you once you engage in a full-on war the nebula is kind of it's able to swing roll in if it in an emergency it can back up the galaxies and the other heavy hitters um as part of the battle line and if it's not quite as urgent then the nebula can act as a an anchor point or a, a focus for a heavy cruiser group or something like that yes yeah i mean with um what that does is that kind of actually helps clear it up because then the other um three that we have here um particularly with mm. the Gemidar battle cruiser is that then puts that then does put them squarely in the battle cruiser yes. like you look at the parliament it's got massive impulse engines mm -hmm. you can see them jutting off the back they yeah. they they are huge and like it's rolled as an engineering ship whatever that means but <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's got enough power to just move huge objects potentially yeah. um and then you've got the the Cardassian Janissary, which is from um, what was it from Armada the Armada Three mod. But essentially, yeah. you can see it's 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 a larger, longer galore. But despite that, it's still it's still not. It doesn't look that big compared to the rest. No, like it's long, but it's probably pretty yeah. flimsy. And yeah, it's it's, lo relying. it's long. It's fast. It probably hits a bit. Hits quite hard when it arrives. But if you I mean, it, one thing that's not there, which we'll probably come on to talk to about a bit later, it, in some ways it almost reminds me of the, the Valdor class warbird from Nemesis. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, before we get on yeah. to that, I thought mm -hmm. we'd also address one another ship that I use, again, yeah. which I think naturally exists. I've, I've sent it, but it is the Romulan Raptor, which is basically half a Dodoridex. Essentially yeah. the Miranda slash nebula but on a deduridex scale kind of scale yeah. um so in for the romulans it is a battle cruiser because it's not a deduridex mm. but i think as most as far as in terms of performance and as mm. far as most other powers was concerned they probably still just treat it as a as a deduridex because you look at it compared to a gem hadar battle cruiser the battle cruiser didn't want to fight it it probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have to yeah yeah i mean and it, it, this kind of thing it does make sense for the romulans to have because mm. other otherwise they are as represented in alpha canon until at least until nemesis they are a little bit stuffed in the fact it's like well you you either have a Dederodex or what a scout ship yes yes <laughs> um, a tiny little escort yeah it's like zero to 100 no no breaks in between Whereas, yeah, this kind of thing, it fleshes their fleet out a little bit. And much like, you know, the Miranda or the Centaur or the Nebula kind of represent quicker, easier to build versions that use roughly the same technology and in, and in many cases whole parts as the premier federation ship of the period. This kind of is, is the same kind of thing of like, OK, yeah, we, we, we have a Dideradex. But it's an incredibly expensive and resource intensive build. So you can kind of almost, not quite, but maybe almost get two of these for every Dideradex. Yes. At which point they're you know, they they're gonna be quite a useful fleet supplement. Yes. Well they, they probably have the ability to go faster and actually serve as a kind of um scout for the Romulan fleet. And again, something that's of that size, not mm. much is going to to phase you maybe apart from very organized uh, enemy formations mm. uh, but the problem it does run into is that it probably i haven't there isn't a gem hadar fighter on that picture but mm. you know how small that is yeah there's no way that there's no way this thing is going to get them no just they're just going to maneuver swarm around it, it <laughs> yeah. and then swarm it so that's for me that's part of the impetus for something like the valdor which i haven't yet uh, scaled up mm. it's much much leaner and smaller and agile yes and it, it the valdor does demonstrate that kind of as i say that kind of battle cruiser feel to it in that it, it is sleek i mean it's a, still a relatively substantial vessel and when you see it in nemesis it does have quite a quite a fearsome array of firepower when it's swooping in on the scimitar but then as soon as it comes over the scimitar basically guts one with a well-timed yes. blast which really? yes again is very much battle cruiser levels of vulnerability it's like it's everything's fine right up until somebody 
shoots back. <laughs> yes, I mean you compare it to the to the Enterprise E, mm. which is probably yeah a battleship. Yeah. Uh, in in as much as you know when that that takes a lot more hits than than both of the outdoors or near is yeah what they sometimes called yeah. but it takes it takes way more firepower than either of them they show up and uh, blow up in the space of about five minutes yeah and i think the other thing that both nemesis and um season one of picard show in a way is that the romulans are evolving their fleet doctrine because the Dederodex okay. is big and heavy and Okay, it's not got you know, the top-down profile of a Dederodex is huge, but let's face it, the frontal profile of a Dederodex is also pretty large. Yes. And one thing I've noticed of you know the Dederodex really likes its all forward like run in and blast everything in sight attacks from what we've seen in all in the various series. The yes, everything that post dates the Dederodex in terms of Romulan design has an absolutely tiny forward profile. And then you yeah. see that attack run by the Valdor in in Nemesis, as we say, where it's just blasting away with everything in sight. And it almost makes me think that maybe the Romulans, they they still really like their massive f frontal assault, which works especially mm. well with them having cloaks. Yes. But they maybe realise that if if you've got a big face to shoot at, like a Derodex has, then maybe maybe the enemy will just blast back. And you could take a bit of a pounding, whereas these low low forward profile ships seem like the kind of things that could make this almost strafing run style assault, but actually take very little in terms of return fire, with the the kind of the, the trade off being that if it doesn't work and your enemy is still intact, then you still have a fairly large top down or bottom up profile which can then be raked as you yes. pass over, the which is as as we said exactly, exactly what, happens what happens to the Valdor. Yes, I mean, uh, I would, I would just put in one caveat, which mm -hmm. is that with the Dederodex, while it does fire basically from its deflector dish, that was not the intention. No. It's meant to fire from those little uh, balls yes. across the ship, so that it would have, it would have been so cool. It would have had eye. It would have freaking laser beams coming out of its, <laughs> its eyes. eyes. Yes, it would have yeah. looked so good. But yeah, that's just that's just a. So it is more so on the basis of that armament, mm. which was intended by the uh, designer by Andrew Probert, mm -hmm. it would have basically just had this sort of all-round firepower. The um, you kind of imagine if you then have like say four Dederodexes in a formation, mm. they're all able to concentrate fire into multiple targets, mm. and they've got multiple guns that are basically in different areas so you basically have your guns that are depending on where you are in the formation or port and starboard disruptors or um if you're at the t kind of point, point and rear mm. or fore and aft can they can tackle one group of enemies and then your other disruptors kind of cover a whole other sort of grid again with mutually supporting overlapping arcs of fire yeah, I was going to say the, the the main the main weakness of the Dederodex even even with that kind of armament is that um, it's not really going to... It's going to have some fairly significant aft blind spots. Um, yeah, so it, it, it goes it from being, a, as seen in canon, pretty much direct frontal assault to... I'd call it an indirect... As you say, an indirect frontal assault. It, it's the forward arc, if you like. The forward 180 yeah. degrees is, is then covered, um, but still a little lacking. Compa certainly, I mean, compared to Klingon designs... It's it's got a broader range of cover, but compared to Federation designs, where the saucer is basically a three hundred and sixty degree weapons platform, that there's still a, a bit of a blind spot for them. Yes, yes, and that that would be then when formation and other tactics come in. I'm just thinking if we're talking about the Dederodex specifically now, um, it's probably worth mentioning because in TNG they call it a battle cruiser. Mm. Except you look at it, and it's, it's it's huge, especially when properly scaled and not not what they did in Deep Space Nine, which was mm. scale it down so that it wouldn't just overwhelm the screen. Yes, um, which would have just been hilarious. It's just like 
here's the Federation fleet and here's the Dominion fleet and they're all fighting together with the Klingons involved and the Breen and the whole thing is just happening, you know, between the two holes of a Deterodex. Yes! <laughs> Which is very confused. Hey, what's, what are you guys doing? Yeah. Um... Yeah, because it's called a battle cruiser, and yeah, it's it's huge. <laughs> My kind of sort of, to an extent, a rationalization is that it was probably built. It was built probably before the Galaxy class. They seem to have plenty of them around by next generation. Mm. And so when they were looking at Starfleet, who they were thinking they were going to go up against, they were looking at stuff like the Ambassador and Excelsior and like, we need to kill lots of those. We can't ever have that many ships, so we need something that's going to be really big and mean that can just kill lots of cruisers. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, the, at least in Alpha Can with the Romulans, and especially in DS9 where the Romulans just seem to show up with the Deridexes, I suppose there is a certain amount of economy of scale of, you know, here's a production line, we just keep building these. Yes, yeah, I th I think once 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 you've got them, and particularly once because they are quite useful because because they are so big and the Romulans aren't just purely a warrior race. You know, mm. they like doing science and exploration, even if it is for like nefarious purposes. Um, they do like to do those things, and the Dideridex is certainly a very good platform for doing that. You could definitely have all sorts of like science labs and all that on board a ship that size mm. yeah so i mean yeah it, it it makes sense for who the it makes sense for who they are the as the romulans um i would be yeah i would be tempted to call it a battle cruiser in that it, it does seem to have some limitations um compared to some other ships of its like you know mm. the, the its size class suggests that if if it was a true battleship it should just dominate yes but and, i mean it's got it this huge amount of doesn't. negative space which doesn't really help and as you say it, it just it doesn't it's it's a it's a threat and it's a big <sighs> threat but you know when in tng when one confronts the enterprise d the Enterprise, Picard is sort of like, that's okay, that's interesting, but I'm not necessarily backing down. And then, um, yes, I mean, is 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 Picard though, you might say, is Picard sort of banking on the wider consequences of his destruction? Possibly, that... but when when you see them in other circumstances, I'm um, thinking of the TNG episode where they run into the Enterprise um, frozen in time, where it turns out they're, they're actually trying to help a warbird. But yes. when when the um, when the the TNG crew in the runabout when they see the Enterprise fighting, uh, what they think is fighting the warbird, their reaction isn't oh well the Enterprise must be about to be destroyed or oh why why are they why was the Enterprise fighting this hopeless fight? It's like oh. They're fighting a warbird. It's like no, no yeah. one seems particularly shocked by the idea that the Enterprise might try and take on a warbird and win. Um, and yeah, uh, and I mean, you, I, you kind I, of see this thing of where where the enemy capital ships are involved, be they a galaxy class or whatever, they're not massively overwhelmed by the idea of warbirds. They respect them, but. Yeah. Given the size differential, you'd expect them to fear them. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, th I think, yeah, certainly in the way I've portrayed the Dominion War, the only mm. people who genuinely fear the warbirds mm. and absolutely terrified them are the Cardassians. Yes. And, and they, will, they will see a warbird, you know, once the Romulans start joining the war. All it takes is for the warbirds to just decloak and the Cardassians are like, no, no, I'm going home. That's it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, they, as I say, they're very, they are very powerful, but they're also they're they're powerful in a way that I I know this will enrage people, but to be honest, I've said it enough times. It's probably the people who are enraged are going to be enraged anyway. It's <laughs> almost Bismarck like in that it it's it's powerful, but it's also hilariously inefficient and ends up being far too big for what it could otherwise be. Yes. Yes, I mean, speaking of Bismarck, I, mm. I think I've 
obviously put up now the um, sort of the main battleship chart yes. or the top of the line battleship chart because the galaxy isn't mm -hmm. on it, but you can sort of yeah. uh, infer Substitute. from that. Um, yeah. You can you basically have two schools of battleship from what mm. I I can observe from these. Mm. You have um, what I would describe as siege battleships or mm -hmm. battleships with a siege capacity. So that mostly includes the Dominion battleship, which has those two big siege guns. Those are those big spikes yeah. wings, and then the Negvar, which has mm -hmm. those big siege guns which compared to the battleship siege guns are pathetic. Uh, uh, possibly the Hutet, because though it has like those wing-mounted cannons, but those are more intended for um, anti-starship roles. They were intended to be like its main galaxy-killing weapon. So mm. maybe just... But So you have that, then you have ships like the Sovereign and sort of some of the other ones we've looked at, which are more... I don't know what you described, like maybe fleet battleships. Yeah, they're a little bit more, a little bit more agile. Um, it's kind of all round, all round firepower as opposed mm. to you know lots and lots of firepower forward, but possibly slightly vulnerable if you get around their size. I mean, they're still battleships, but the level of ability for them to counterattack you drops dramatically compared to their forward arc. Yes. I mean, I, I almost wonder, we're talking about this whole 1890s period, mm. and I actually wonder, is, is the Sovereign class actually HMS Dreadnought? Is it the start of that? Because, you know, and again, you're sort of veering into beta cannon, but as mm. you say, with the Romulans after the Dominion War, even in Picard, even though they don't include my favourite Romulan ship, uh, the Kirchen, mm -hmm. which is like still like a smaller compacted version of the Dideridex, sort of leaner and meaner. Um, but uh, yeah, there is that, even in the Picard, there is that sort of leaning towards smaller scale and more agility. And I wonder, is the Sovereign kind of the forerunner to all of that? Um, yes... Yeah, in in a, in a way, um, I mean, the, the sovereign is a slightly difficult one to place for me. In that, you know, she's longer than a galaxy, mm. but significantly smaller mass. Yes, and I I think the sort of, this is where I sort of say the sovereign. You, know, you have the sovereign, the Prometheus, and Defiant, and these kind of things that they, to me they seem to be the this is what the Federation can do when they design a ship that basically has minimal extraneous accoutrements and is primarily designed as a combat vessel which plays back again into the sort of hot, who actually has the technological upper hand here considering that the sovereign can go toe to toe with a lot of ships that are a lot bigger than it is yes i mean you look at it it faces off against well, the scimitar which mm -hmm. is you might say the scimitar is a bit ridiculous yeah <laughs> um, a, a, bit, a bit crazy weird formula and reman Probably Breen and Dominion technology in there as well, given all the spikiness. Mm -hmm. um, then even like it fights two sonar, uh, sonar battle cruisers. Yep, those sort of big crescent-shaped cruisers, um, which I've said actually re look remarkably like Cardassians uh, built them. Like mm -hmm. they have that sort of similar architecture to Deep Space Nine, bizarrely enough, that Art Deco look. I wonder if the if the during the Dominion War, the Sona would basically sell them Ketracel right, and in return, the Cardassians would give them on the kind of the download these new battle cruisers, protect themselves. Yeah. Um, hmm. it's, <sighs> so the thing is, that everything to, to me looking at this. Mm -hmm. Um, apart from the Dideridex, everything else comes about all roughly contemporaneously, within a few years of each other. Yes, yeah, the Dideridex is by far the the sort of yeah the oldest. I mean, because the Negvar shows up immediately pre Dominion War, 
the yeah, Hutet, about- in theory, for it to have, for it, if it in the, obviously the beta canon that it shows up in, is probably a pre-war project. Yes, and then and the, the battleship we don't we don't know. The, the, the thing with the Dominion War is obviously with this German. It comes to the German Hadar, they're cut off for the most part from the Gamma Quadrant, so we don't necessarily know if the Dominion had battleships in the Gamma Quadrant and they just decided, okay, we're now now's time to build one of these things here, or whether, as was said, I think in the DS Nine episode, that it's kind of it's a response to the Alpha Quadrant powers, which would then, if it is a res- like a brand new design, would make it the single they will make it the newest ship here yeah well because you have yeah the sort of the alpha m hadar that's mm. in the one one little ship episode where the runabout gets shrunk um and yeah they specifically mentioned the idea of alpha gem hadar and i wonder yeah is, is how far from that do you then go to getting yeah just new ships or new versions of ships for the alpha quadrant in in the episode i do which kind of covers the sort of introduction, the Battle of the Giants. Mm-hmm. They say that they encounter because the Romulans went and orbitally bombarded. Well, they thought they were orbitally bombarding the Founders' homeworld. They yeah. they weren't. It was the wrong target or whatever. But, you know, they went and they they saw this kind of firepower that was out in the in the Alpha Quadrant. And you think about the uh, the Dominion in the Gamma Quadrant. They were probably so comfortably in power for so long. All they needed was those Jem'Hadar battle cruisers, and then suddenly they're realizing, oh, that actually be enough. Um, and so that's when perhaps they start thinking about building them, maybe even start building them in the Gamma Quadrant. I think in Star Trek Online, um, with the Dominion fleet that like comes through, it was basically the Dominion fleet that was being sent through the wormhole mm. before it got uh, MacGuffined away, and. That fleet does have Jem'Hadar battleships, among others, as well. Yeah. So the idea was maybe, yeah, they were they were coming through, um, but they but they were then lost, and then they decide to build them, especially after the Romulans join the war, and they're like, okay, no, we need these, we need these now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's it's a big ship. Um. Yeah, I mean. Interestingly, it, it seems to have, and granted, uh, we sort of skipped over the Dominion Battle Cruiser. The mm. Dominion Battle Cruiser, whenever we see it fire, seems to basically just fire its torpedo pod. Just yeah. seems to hang back and sort of snipe. But when the Valiant engages the Dominion Battleship, the thing just spews torpedoes. Mm. It doesn't even seem to bother with on beam so it almost again seems like yeah to an extent maybe they're copying something like the akira yeah and i mean uh, it, it strikes me the way we see the dominion battle cruiser operating it certainly speaks to a certain it, it almost seems to fit the way that we're the dominion is described to us in its kind of pre-war operating in the gamma quadrant phase in the it's not necessarily a ship that's designed for a knockdown drag out fight because what what do we see in the you know it's, it's it's a very well they're supposed to have been like an evil federation equivalent so mm. you will see them acting a bit like some of the larger colonial powers in the 19th century where a few jemhadar maybe with an, a a jemhadar fighter will show up and that's enough to scare the local populace into line usually and not yeah. so much because they can't take out half a dozen Jemadar, but more because, you know, they know what happens if they do. Um, yes. And then, you know, in the rare cases that someone doesn't take the hint, the idea, you know, Dominion Battle Cruiser shows up, le- volleys a bunch of torpedoes, blows everything up, and everybody's on the ground crying for mercy at that point. Yes. That's all it's yes. ever needed to do. And maybe yeah. act as a command and control vessel for the for the dominion fighters and to an extent you kind of see that in ds9 where they're mostly in sort of things like sacrifice of angels they're mostly hanging around near the back of the lines um Mm. and as you said the few times you see them coming in they come in they volley off a really heavy forward um blast of of torpedoes 
which is, is pretty lethal. But then you see the one that is kind of the, the last ship in the line in Sacrifice of Angels, and it, it albeit that it may have been damaged beforehand, it does in, in in the end go down to a strafing run by two birds of prey and a defiant, um, which yes. suggests the fragility of the battle cruiser type. Yes, yeah. My my thinking is that it probably took some hits from a vodka. Yeah, um, or possibly a. Has- one of the uh, the legendary sacrifice of angels wandering galaxies <laughs> yes <laughs> so we talk, we talked about this when um when we did this the first yeah. time uh, i just wonder if you want to explain this yeah. to the audience because i didn't realize this so i've played back through sacrifice of angels so many times i actually had when i got the original vhs tape i actually wore away that section of the tape it started to become <laughs> fuzzy because it was it was the first big battle that we'd ever seen with two sides starships going at each other and one thing i noticed was basically the galaxies go in with everybody else when cisco orders the initial attack and you have that legendary scene where two of them basically just a bully a galore out of existence in about five seconds mm-hmm. flat uh, without even without even sort of lowering themselves to use a photon torpedo there's just a couple of massive phaser yeah. blasts and game over but then once that initial push is done, it seems like the galaxy class are, are almost more crewed by Federation races more aligned with the Klingons than anything else, because they just go off kill hunting. They they just wander <laughs> off into the battle lines with no <laughs> compunction or idea as to you know what the objective is. They're just going around murdering things um, to the point that in a, in one particular shot, just bef- when the um, when the SeaTac and the Majestic are going in with the two Mirandas going in with the Defiant, you get an overhead shot kind of around about that time and when the when the Klingons are coming in, and you see a galaxy, happy as a clam, wandering around, going almost in the opposite direction. <laughs> it's not damaged, it's not trailing fire, it's blasting away at things, and you sort of track back its path. It's like that thing basically got to the other side of the Dominion lines, turned around and went, no, I haven't killed enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> it just came back again with apparently no one able to stop it. Um, <laughs> given the sheer amount of firepower that those things are seen to put out in that and other DS9 episodes, it's kind of like, well, you know, if the two galaxies that had been close by to the Defiant when they started its initial charge stayed with it, that entire battle probably would have been about 30 seconds of the galaxies just carving a path and then Cisco's like yes. thanks guys off we go uh, and instead yes. the ga- literally every almost every wide shot of that battle and even some of the close ups where you can see what's going on in the background it's like the galaxies have just like okay well the battle's joined now we're just going to wander off and do our own yeah, thing and do our own They're completely thing. confident I, in their own survival <laughs> I wonder I wonder if you could I, I think if someone wanted to like do a animation or something mm. what they we should have is you know all the starfleet ships are together they're squaring off against the dominion line they're ready to go they're waiting for the word mm. and then just one of the galaxies is like Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> i mean i i kind of wonder given that the galaxies were obviously exploration ships i know we kind of talked about this a little bit in in the previous unrecorded version but um you know with them being primarily exploration ships beforehand, they have a lot more volume than a sovereign does. And then we see the the war refits, as they're often called, with things like the venture. And I kind of look at them and go, you know, if you stripped out the families, the science labs, the sort of apartment sized suites for the crew that you see in the a regular galaxy, and you just filled that with shield generators and torpedoes and phaser arrays and uh, power generators and so forth you would make a fearsome battleship which it seems is what they did well it's Um, like actually uh, and i'm going to probably upset people because i'll mention picard the dreaded season two of picard mm. because you have that that drawing of the uh confederation galaxy yes which is is basically that i mean you know it's i like they 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 liked it enough to make a drawing. They didn't like it enough to actually do a 3D model. No. Thinking about that, was, the drawing's all you get. But um, I mean, what I would say, because I'm a bit skeptical about powering up the galaxy due, with the Dominion War refit. Mm. It's already pretty powerful. 
uh, in TNG. Mm. I wonder if it's more just means of sustainment. So, for example, yes, you're right, putting in more, like, capacitors for phaser banks. So it's less that you can kind of hit with any more power, because you can only hit with as much power as the phaser emitters can do. It's more that you're going to be able to fire for longer without depleting your reserves. Uh, similar thing with the torpedoes, yeah. just more more of a magazine. You know, so on and so forth. Um, also maybe carrying uh, marines and ground troops and stuff like that as well. Um, so that it's more capable of sustaining, as, as we kind of mm. referenced with the Prometheus, it's capable of lasting the war that's the the important thing rather than its immediate tactical take capabilities yeah and i suppose you know even if it's relatively low level upgrade so you don't make it into a complete death machine um the so kind of even the low level upgrades of things would still make for quite the fearsome um vessel just because it's got the it's then just got a simple ability to take damage yes it's just it's just got the mass um to play with so the the galaxy definitely i think merits a place as a battleship yes um, definitely it's just yeah. um it's just not not of it the sovereign is kind of it's a galaxy's worth of firepower in a smaller and more agile platform plus it has the quantum torpedoes yes yes i mean yeah talking about taking damage and again i feel that was probably primarily what the Dominion battleship was meant to do, almost, hmm. uh, because it, it it looks armored um, compared to a lot of the other Gem Hadar ships, which look quite nice and ornate. But especially like the battle cruisers, hmm. almost feel too pretty compared to this, which is very angular and and uh, robust, and you know has all this heavy looking plating. I wonder if actually part of the idea of the Dominion battleship was to just serve as a massive a uh, bullet sponge in the middle of the battle so that people weren't going around uh, focusing on the gem hadar so the smaller fighters would actually have a chance to you know swoop in and do their sort of squadron swarming attack yeah and they've and they've um and they kind of acknowledge the fact that yeah it's big it's not particularly agile it's not going anywhere fast which is why as you said in the in the valiant episode it kind of has this all around firepower it wouldn't surprise yeah. me, to be honest, if they just took, you know, maybe they just took the torpedo, the rapid fire torpedo launcher that is kind of the main armament of the battle cruiser, and just went this, but lots of this. Lots, <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean, the only other kind of armament, again, not shown in canon, but clearly mm. visible on the model, is those siege guns. Yes. Actually, I wonder to an extent, were those a product of, were those a product of facing Deep Space Nine? as we mentioned in the yeah. previous episode on the monitors that D, you know they kind of took a lot of losses against ds9 in fact mm. arguably it almost did worse than the klingons i don't know that mm. might be a bit of a contentious statement but when the klingons attack with the negvar once the negvar decides to open fire with the siege guns yes. it's it's you know it's all time over. yeah yeah i mean i think this is the thing the, the klingons do a a one wave at a first wave attack and then garon's just like yeah they're, they're, this is stupid siege guns go and then the you'd think the dominion would have learned because you know they <laughs> um they're the ones who attack ds9 second yes and i that's supposed to a degree they're maybe still hoping their polar on beams will cut through because they do seem surprised when the first wave i think yes. i think Wayne even says it's like impossible the kind of yes. thing i mean we, we we're tre we're treading old ground there but yeah. like the point i was thinking is that like deep space and like the the main thing is the reason that they abandoned the station is not mm. that it's about to be destroyed it's because they've already laid the minefield and there's nothing more they can do yeah so they may as well retreat it's it does there's not the same suggestion that they've you know the shields are down and, and no. they're close to breaking no um, and they've then they've obviously made it a lot more ready for war in terms of offloading vulnerable people than they did yes. in way of the warrior where it was all a bit last minute but um yeah but yeah may, may, they may have i think well i think it's probably yes partly ds9 but also i'm thinking 
in terms of during the Dominion advance into Federation space. Again, the Federation seems to only do things in two sizes because the kinds of deep space stations we see, the Federation starbases, you either see relatively small ones like Starbase 359 um and so forth the kind of the regulus station yeah. upside down yeah. version which you know you, a, a dozen ships should be able to take that thing out yes the, i mean it, yeah. it, it partially de depends on how it's scaled because there is scaling shenanigans because it appears mm. in next generation in uh, measure of a man mm -hmm. this huge station um well, that yeah, that's what I was going to get to. Is like you have the like space dock one from Earth, but now scaled to the point it can swallow a, a galaxy the same way that the Earth yeah. one can swallow a constitution. And I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, the small stuff. Okay, the Dominion's not going to have a problem with that. They've got enough ships, but you know that monstrous thing that yes. the Enterprise D goes into is like that thing. You you think DS9 was tough? That thing yes. should have enough firepower to lay waste to fleets. And I'm just thinking if maybe the the during their advance they came across certain systems which just happened to have these these monstrous space stations in and were just like well, we can't crack them. Yes. So you, you can sweep uh, uh, the fleet away from around them, but what the heck do you do about this this basically doom base in space? Yes, I mean basically, as far as the like, I think I even referenced that in Ooh. in my Dominion War episodes, particularly in like yeah the stuff that covers that early advance, mm. and they basically just have to say, forget about it, leave it behind, yeah. don't worry about it. I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah, um, which just, would explain why why they come up with this battleship because not only has it got to bring the siege guns but it's also got to last under the firepower of a, a monster star base long enough to bring those siege guns to bear yes and it doesn't have what the negvar has which is the negvar could of course just cloak yes yeah uh, cloak and poke effectively. yeah yeah um, and just on the on the matter of the negvar you have the one with the siege guns but then you mm -hmm. also have in all good things and i think end game as well you yeah. have the variants without the siege guns mm -hmm. and you, and again those kind of fall more into kind of regular i don't know fleet battleship role yes um, yeah they're they're much more they're much more kind of just a line battleship with general round firepower yes i mean they're still because they're klingon they still have a lot of emphasis on that that frontal firepower mm -hmm. um but, like, yeah, it, it seems a bit more balanced. Because apart from possibly a Dominion Battleship and possibly a Dodiridex, if, again, if the if the Negvar uh, got the drop on it, mm -hmm. I don't see them using siege guns on many actual starships. No. you. I mean, you like, get the feeling that it's probably like, yeah, if one hits, it's dead. But it's going to be very difficult to get that hit in. Yes, yeah. I mean, one of the things that, yeah, when you're engaging the Dominion battleships later in the war, the main thing is just don't go in front of it. Whatever you do, like, just don't line up with the siege guns. Yeah. I mean, it's you're still going to get torpedoed, but at least you won't get one-shotted. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so... and. Um... I mean, it, it it fits. It does. To be honest, the 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 different sizes of battleships again, they kind of fit within the scope of the overall um, period, the historical period mm. that we we've, we've been looking at. Because when you look at um, the eighteen nineties to the nineteen hundreds, you don't just have battleship. Yeah, there's not. Uh, a feeling of you know this is this is a but this is a battleship this is of a size and this is it obviously towards the end you also get you know dreadnought herself which is a, a, a bigger thing again but even before that when you're just looking at the pre-dreadnought battleships there are pre-dreadnought battleships that are kind of in the 15 16 plus thousand ton range and there's ships that ostensibly are also contemporaries but are maybe half that size 
mm. and mass. They're all trying to contest the same field. They're all trying to with vaguely similar calibers of armament, but some are mm. bigger, faster, long range, better armored, or just have more general firepower than others. I mean, and yeah, were there some with perhaps like very different sort of mission profiles? Or expected to go to different places, or built for like different areas, possibly. Yeah, well, you've got you've got um, some ships which are designed on the basis of they have to defend local local um, areas. So, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the Russian ships, for example, and to a certain degree, the French ships are only really expected to defend the local areas around their home nations and if they're deployed to any kind of overseas colony they can go there but then they'd be expected to defend that location um they're not kind of true world spanning ships and then you have yeah. you know, the british ships which are designed to do that but rely on a network of overseas bases for fuel and then you have american ships which by and large are mostly doing the home defense type thing but they have to get across the pacific yeah. so if they're going to go across the pacific they have to have a massive amount of fuel aboard which you know that that has certain influences and then so that's just that's just size and fuel of fuel tanks and range and speed yeah. and things and then you have different ideas about firepower the french have this idea of more distributed firepower um you know more, more all around slightly smaller guns there's the more conventional twin heavy guns forward twin heavy guns back the germans go in for this idea of getting in up close and personal with more rapid fire but smaller caliber weapons initially they then decide it's a stupid idea and they abandon it um and you know it, it, there, there's all sorts of sub variations within the theme and it kind of reflects what you see what you see here where you know yeah. something like the Dideradex, the hutet the jemhadar battleship they're not the world's most agile, but they bring a lot of firepower to the table. The Negvar, as we just said, comes in two different variants. The Sovereign is very much the, I have a very big punch, but I can deliver it wherever and whenever I like. And the Galaxy yes. is probably like, it's certainly in a War Galaxy refit, is a, I can also deliver a very big punch, but I'm more of a tank. Yes. I mean, I mean, just thinking, particularly when you talked about fuel and range, mm. that that is definitely a factor, because um, because the Romulans have the quantum singularity core basically they don't need to stop to refuel they're mm. like a, a nuclear submarine they can keep going but they just travel very slowly but it's fine because you have a cloaking device so you can get anywhere you want no one can really stop you you are going to do it very slowly mm. as compared to yeah and then you have the dominion battleship which again you have those like pods the underside which i think are, i think are probably just extra fuel tanks because the thing was probably you think about the dominion in the gamma quadrant they probably had plenty of refueling stations and things like that and then suddenly they get to the hostile alpha quadrant and they don't enjoy that luxury and they suddenly realize they need to be carrying more fuel with them mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i and it kind of in a way you, you you can almost see the Dominion in the Gamma Quadrant almost taking certain themes from kind of the the extra evil version of the British Empire, which is <laughs> probably some kind of someone probably somewhere took as an in, a point of inspiration. Um, well, it was written. It was written by Americans, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. So <laughs> if they, if they think oh evil empire we need to portray, that probably is their go to, um, mm. but. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of you. You you can see if because we don't get much of a sense in the Gamma Quadrant that the Domino are doing all that much expansion, or if it's happening, it's happening very slowly. So you can imagine most of their fleet infrastructure is based around uh, an environment where they have a large series of fleet bases um, yeah. with easy points to refuel within which their fleet operates and navigates. At which point, you know, the fact that they've got um the fact the fact that the, maybe the bat their battle cruisers and fighters don't have a, the greatest range operation range doesn't matter quite as much um yes. whereas as you said the romulans they have to go on deep cover missions long term so a bit like submarines they have to have the long range 
the Cardassians are just happy to have something that can go toe to toe with the top end. <laughs> um, yes, it's yes, like they don't care it's, about it's, anything else. Yes, and they don't they don't have many, and it's it's pretty um, roughly put together. It's actually, I suppose, an example of certain pre dreadnoughts where it's got a real mix of guns. Um, and it's even got like a, a fighter contingent as well, mm. just so the Cardassians cover all their bases. Like, because this thing's going to have to do everything. This is the best we can do. It needs to do all of it. Yes. Yeah. It's. Um, it's. Yeah. You, you've got to feel a little bit sorry for the Cardassians in some ways. I mean, they're they're not the, exactly the <laughs> nicest of, fa- of factions, but they do seem to have this habit of consistently picking fights there where they immediately get their faces stepped on yes. uh, without mercy. I mean, even, even with things like the Federate, the Federation, as you've you kind of pointed out in, in your series on that, it's kind of the Cardassians are showing up with that. They're initially losing. Then they show up at the last minute with their, what at the time is their latest and greatest, the galore. And the Federation's like, eh, well, okay, I, I guess we can't send right. in the C team anymore. <laughs> um, I, and it's like, yeah, okay, this is this has stopped being fun. Let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it's, it's not the effortless good. stomp it was before. I guess I guess we'll have to actually think about maybe either taking this seriously or just wandering off disinterested. Which, like, to to the Cardassians. I mean, can you, given the Cardassian mentality, at least as from what we see in the show, can you imagine the um, the amount of humiliation involved for them? Yeah. If yes, they're, they're sort of like for them. Oh, what was it? It's almost like that Street Fighter quote of like, you know, the the day that M Bison turned up at your village was the most important day in your life. For M Bison, it was Tuesday. <laughs> uh, and it's like it's the same thing for the, for the Cardassians. This is a knockdown, drag out existential struggle for the very future of the Union, and for the Federation, it's like, okay, you're being irritating now. Fine, what do you want to go away? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that, that that even like makes sense with the fact that as early as what is it? When's Chain of Command? I can't remember what year Chain of Command is. Mm. Literally, I feel like the 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 ink has barely dried yes the peace treaty and the Cardassians already want to go again or yeah. feel like they can and at the same time the federation has introduced a nebula class which basically goes on a one man rampage across Cardassian yes. lines one which doesn't is... even that yeah that one doesn't even have the extra torpedo launchers no it's, it's, it's just got like an AWAX dish yeah it's like so it can see things it can see things it wants to kill slightly better <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it, and it goes on an absolute tear, and they still decide, yes, yes, we still want to fight you. Yeah, they're just like throwing ships at it like a bunch of lemmings. <laughs> just the, if if it wasn't if it wasn't, I mean, to be honest, even like even when they transmit the uh, the override codes and shut down the shields, you know, Picard doesn't. Well, he's not particularly happy with the Cardassians, but Picard doesn't seem to. St- think that there's a particular risk of even an unshielded nebula being immediately destroyed by the opposition yeah. <laughs> um, he's kind of like okay we, we've now made it kind of a fair fight and enough to to make the, the make this captain see sense <laughs> which given yeah. that the nebula is kind of as we said it's like that the second class battleship of the federation the fact it's just t- probably torn half of the cardassian order apart and <laughs> is is squaring off to fight the rest despite the fact that it's got no shields it says everything you need to know about the le- ver- relative technological capabilities yes yeah and yeah it also explains it does it does and we're sort of then leaning into like speculation how much in the way of Dominion upgrades and technology did the Cardassians get by the end? You start again. You start mm. looking at stuff like um, Star Trek Online. I did a video on mm. the Cardassian Damar class. Yeah, which is it's a very nice uh, model. It's a very nice looking ship, um, but it does seem to have a lot of that kind of, you know, some degree of Dominion influence. It's also more leaning on the Art Deco design of DS Nine. Yeah, I mean, I get a, I get the feeling, especially given the way that um, you you kind of see the the Dominion. I think always saw the Cardassians as a 
subservient race, mm. but the way they act about it gets more and more obvious as things progress. So, yes, like initially they're humouring the Cardassians. Yeah, they're humouring Dukat, and Dukat is just savvy enough of an operator that he can he can get enough over on them that they they're like okay we have to play we 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 don't like him we think that he's a, a, an upstart client race but we kind of have to throw him a bone now and then yes whereas yes, we by have to let him look like he's leading the war effort yeah and there's all these uncomfortable compromises and then but when when Damar is in charge it it kind of it starts off as are you going to do better than Ducat? But it's very the first time very we see Damar in charge, he's already very much secondary to Weiyun rather than yes. a sparring partner. And then by the end, they're just like, uh, yeah, Damar, you're going to do this. Yeah, <laughs> and just, it, when he flares up, they're just like, no, no, you are going to do this, aren't you? Good dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then yeah, and then after Damar, Damar is gone by the end they're just like oh yeah good figurehead go do what we want <laughs> yes it is literally just well i feel like by that point had the war gone on longer they'd just be wheeling in and out cassian officers yeah like going down and down until it got to like a lowly private or whatever yeah it's just like congratulations you are in charge of the card in of the cardassian union today <laughs> do a good job because uh you know tomorrow is <laughs> your successor will have to live up to you um but yeah and I have a feeling they probably didn't get all that much. Uh, because when you think about like when Damar initially led his rebellion, he he had several full orders of the Cardassian military with him. And then the Dominion crushed them like bugs very quickly once they found out where their bases were. Um, and yeah. you, you see the sacrifice of angel battles. Obviously, the Galore doesn't do that well there. Um, and even at the end... Um, in the final battle over Cardassia, when the when they turn on the Dominion, most of what they turn what most of the what they turn around and start destroying is Jem'Hadar attack ships. Yes, which they is, they, they th most they most notably they don't attack the Jem'Hadar battleships because yeah. the final sequence. Granted, they are ridiculously overscaled. Yes, um, just to like make it look even I, I don't know more ridiculous it, it reminds mm. me of a scene i can't remember from what though um but yeah and you have three and had our battleships still ready to go mm. um and then yeah so i think that the Cardassians probably didn't get an awful lot of assistance from the dominion in upgrading their technology certainly their offensive and defensive technology maybe their sensor and propulsion tech but their actual sort of the main combat tech probably didn't get a lot during the dominion war but in the aftermath of the dominion war they they probably would have you know every dominion shipyard every dominion wreck every anything that the dominion had left on in their territory they probably would have just poured over and scavenged left right and center which again yeah. ends up with something like the damar which is it's you can tell it's almost like they've built it out of spare dominion parts but to a cardassian aesthetic yes yeah it definitely feels that kind of yeah is it more i don't know art deco it's it's mm. hard to uh, describe but yeah and it's it, it it's a real departure from the kind of classical uh dominion war cardassian aesthetic yeah it's basically it, the shape is the only thing that's cardassian about it everything else is kind of you know, we we took this from the Dominion. In in fact, it wouldn't surprise me, given given the way that the Dominion at least initially liked to string the Cardassians along, it wouldn't surprise me if one of the earliest things within the Dominion War was um, the the Dominion looking at probably the the first prototype Hutet and going, well, you know, with your great and glorious allies now, we can design you a much much better ship. Yes. And then, you know, constantly designing and refining it and showing the full mm. integration of Dominion and Cardassian technology, but never quite actually delivering on it. Yes, yes. It's sort of uh, 
yeah sort of runaway requirement yeah and then uh, the afterwards in the aftermath of the war the kind of like oh we can actually build this thing now <laughs> yeah we can, yeah we don't actually have to ask ask very nicely can we please mm. build this yeah because i think part of the thing is like of like the who tet or anything like that would be maybe the Cardassians would have a one or two but they're never going to have any more the dominion would have never allowed them to have more of those than they had battleships yes yeah exactly um yeah because i mean the, the hutet it's, an, it's a nice big dreadnought to sort of go 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 play with the federation from <laughs> uh with <laughs> but but yeah it's the kind of thing where the dominion will be like okay they've gone they've they've taken the thing out to go and attack the federation good it's over there you yes. know it, 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 there's not another three sitting in reserve where there could potentially be trouble <laughs> yes yeah and yeah getting any funny ideas exactly yeah so i think i think that's everything covered yeah yeah we've gone through battleships battle cruisers the big capital it, ships um it is a relatively brief relatively brief yes videos Com compared to the dry dock at least <laughs> um, <laughs> but b before we go um i'm, I'm just going to send you this hopefully you'll be able to put it up on screen for everybody the the wandering okay. galaxies <laughs> of of a sacrifice of angels. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> it's just uh, like guys, guys, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> I especially like the the one on the bottom right, uh, which actually is the first, the, chronologically speaking, the first one. Uh, yeah, it's ju just he's... after the Sea Tech and the Majestic have been have been destroyed, and you've got the Defiant desperately dodging and weaving. And it's like, as you can see, that, given the turning radius of a galaxy, that galaxy was further ahead in its efforts to punch through Dominion lines. And it's gone, oh, shiny kill. <laughs> and in the, in the immediate sequence after, it just heads back. <laughs> it's just, I, I'd love to meet whoever the captains of those galaxies were. And it's just like, <laughs> you, you could just imagine the, the post, the post battles, uh, you know, ceremonies where it's like, and the the MVP for the for the match is the captain of the USS Venture with twenty seven individual starship kills. However, since you penetrated Dominion lines three times before the Defiant <laughs> did, we, we, to coin a phrase from Babylon Five, we, we've decided to nail this medal straight into your skull. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear, it's uh. It's, I, I I do love Star Trek, but it, it, it more, especially for some of the absolute funny moments that you get, as well as uh, as well as the more serious ones. Yes, yes, like yeah, just in the episode, in any episode, yeah, just little bits of little bits of comedy. Yeah, sometimes it's sometimes it's intentional, sometimes, sometimes it's not so not. much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh well, right. Well, let's say pleasure, absolute pleasure to do this little series, yes. and um, yeah, hopefully listeners out there have enjoyed it and who knows we can probably come up with something similar at some Most point certainly. in the future um if everybody if everybody likes what we've been doing yes well we've certainly talked up a storm that's for sure yes <laughs> oh okay well see you around everyone thank you guys for watching leave your thoughts in the comments below.